Hello and thanks. Um, about 10 years ago, a little more than that, I decided to go back and get my Master of Fine Arts degree because I wanted to try to teach at the university level. And that decision led myself and my family to move to New Bedford, Massachusetts to attend the University of uh, Massachusetts at Dartmouth. Most of you have probably heard of New Bedford, but you don't know it because it's where the great American classic Moby Dick starts. Uh, in doing research about going there, I found a picture of uh, the world's largest model ship. And it's a half-scale model of an 18th century uh, whaling ship that's in the New Bedford Whaling Museum. When I first saw the picture, I thought the boat was floating on water, and I really wanted to see this. So when our family got settled in, one of our first trips downtown was to see this model ship. Uh, fortunately for us, I think it was fortunate anyway, uh, when we went into the museum, the director happened to be standing right there and she introduced herself. She could tell we were new. She, you know, she saw our sons who were about three and five and she told them, you're going to love this place because you're allowed to go into the exhibits. So they took off and they really loved it and we joined and we spent a lot of time there. And there was a few depressing things that happened, but there were also some really wonderful stuff. One of the first depressing things was the boat was not floating on water. It was, they painted the floor. So I was a little bummed about that. <laughs> but I'll get to some of the better stuff first. Uh, one of the really cool things they have there is they have recordings of whales talking to each other that you can listen to with the push of a button. So it's just amazing. It's really ethereal and spooky and weird and wonderful. And I spent a lot of time listening to them. I should say, probably at the beginning, I'm not a musician, so I'm really grateful to these two I'll introduce later. Uh, another uh, great thing about the museum is they have all these great maps on the wall, and a lot of the maps have these fantastic creatures. And I got to do a lot of thinking about that, as, I was, uh, as you'll understand in a minute, because one of the dark sides of the thing was very quickly, the museum became like a Holocaust museum to me. Anyway, uh, but they were uh, honoring the wrong people, the wrong part. So uh, me, being one of the supposedly superior beings on the planet, uh, thought like, oh my god, how do we say we're sorry about this? I mean, the slaughter was incredible. In its heyday, New Bedford was the richest city in America. And that happened because of the uh, slaughter of millions of magnificent creatures. But back to the early maps. So as I was trying to figure out, can I say I'm sorry and all that stuff, I was, I was always fascinated by these creatures. And I just figured it was the sailors, they saw whales. By the time the ship got home and they had a few drinks, they turned into these fantastic monsters. But I also figured that the ropes on the boats were probably calling the whales. I figured the wind was vibrating the ropes the ropes were connected to the hull of the ship, and that sent vibrations into the water, and the curious whales came up like, what is this? Who, you know, who can't sing? Who is that person? But uh, I wondered if I could recreate that in a way that they could understand, so I did a lot of thinking about that. And in my work in school, I started making really big musical instruments, like gymnasium-sized instruments. And one of the first was a wire that I strung from the basement to the fifth floor of the art building. And as you went up and down the steps, you could play it, and it sounded like a heartbeat. It was amazing. It was like being inside a heart. And on some of those whales, you can drive a Volkswagen through their heart. So uh, to me, it was really it was a phenomenal piece. But I have a friend, David Rogers, who teaches at Kutztown University. And he has a pet peeve, and it said, people complain about animals being dumb because they don't understand us. And he's like, if you're so smart, why don't you understand them? And with that reverberating in my head, I was thinking, all right, how do I speak whale? And me speaking whale uh, is a stretch because English is my second language. I grew up in Philadelphia, so I speak Philadelphian. <laughs> and English is tough. So anyway, as luck would have it, this guy, Bill Close, who invented the uh, earth harp, was coming back to town. He had grown up in the area, and they asked him to come back and do a week's worth of workshops and performances and I wanted to work with him. So I contacted him, and we agreed that I would make him a sound box. And what I did was, oh, this is one of the other things about riding around in New Bedford. 
On the behind that guy, it says a dead whale or a stove boat, meaning if you don't kill them, you better come back dead yourself. So it's kind of horrible to live with. But anyway, I built Bill Close this half a boat, basically, bolt it to the floor of a, a bank building. And uh, he came and hooked up his harp to it, and he was really surprised that he didn't need to use amplification, that it was his first acoustic sound box. So I knew then and there that I was on the right path. And actually, I see, you'll see when Julia plays the boat, I stole the glove, rosin-covered glove idea from him. Uh, then, right at the end of school, I got a job teaching at Moravian. So I, I didn't want to completely put the whale project on hold. So I started an after-school boat building activity. And I built my way up to I got a boat that I could eventually, I thought, play to whales. I saw this ad in Wooden Boat Magazine, and I used to row when I was a kid, and I thought, oh, this would be great. We'll build a boat, I can get, start a rowing club, and I'll turn it into a musical instrument, and we'll go talk to whales. And uh, when I called them up and asked them if I could make it into a musical instrument, would I still be able to race it? They were, uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and you are who? <laughs> but anyway, it kept my dream alive. And then... Uh, <clears throat> As luck would have it, the first international races were held in Scotland in 2013. And I'm usually the screwball in the family that comes up with wild ideas. And I came home the first day that they announced this, and my wife said, we got to get the boat to Scotland. And I was like, oh, man, no. She came over to the dark side. But anyway, <laughs> uh, we now know more about international shipping than we care to, and we're the proud owners of a 40-foot shipping container. But I started to do research into that, and I found out there was a research vessel called the Solorian that was working off the west coast of Scotland. And they have a lot of underwater recording equipment, and they agreed to record us when we got over there. But unfortunately, they were too far to the south, so we didn't get to do it with them. But we did get to meet, or I didn't get to meet. That's my wife and our two sons. They got to meet Princess Anne, and our youngest son, said to her that we were going to try to talk to the whales, and she said, don't you think there might be a bit of a language barrier? <laughs> and, uh, but I, did, I was outside on the row of honors there, saluting her as she went out. But we were lucky in that there was a captain in the town who owned the restaurant, and uh, he really liked what we were trying to do, so he agreed to tell us out on the lock broom. And my wife and a friend, Judy, who we met over there, who was a harpist from Vermont, got in the boat and played it. And as they were playing, we're out in the middle of this water. It was really beautiful. The captain's phone rings, and he hangs up the phone, and he says, see that house up yonder? And we all looked, and it was like a mile and a half, mile and three quarters away. They just called and said, you sound wonderful. So we knew terrestrially it was really working well. So they played it all the way back in. As we come around the thing up to the, where the little town was, Ullapool, it was like the Pied Piper. The people were coming out of the bars, they were coming out of the campground, they were coming off the streets, and they all came down to the beach to watch them play it. As they came in, when they finished, they got a standing ovation. So it was really nice. But I didn't have the recording and stuff, and a lot of people don't believe in that it works. So when I got back to America, I got a grant to get equipment, our own equipment, and I hired a boat, and we went out from Cape May, and um, I, I could prove now that it works. So, because we recorded, dropped in 50 feet of microphone wire and went off a couple hundred yards and got the recording, so now I know that it works. But <clears throat> David Gallo, in his great TED talk, he was saying that 3% of the, uh, we've only explored 3% of our oceans. And if what getting the proof did to me was all of a sudden it brought in bigger issues, like uh, once you can say you're sorry, you can talk to them. So if you're going to talk to them, what are you going to say? What, what does that mean? What's, is it worth anything? So. For one thing, they have the largest brains on the planet. They've been communicating with each other ver vo vocally for over 50, well, for millions of years. I forget I don't know how much exactly. So that led me to think, you know, we have to get over our solipsistic belief that we are the pinnacle of creation. Our opposable thumbs, written language, and superior pack hunting skills have given us a pseudo belief that we rule the planet. And we do in a sense, but we're going to, if we don't, because our numbers are growing so rapidly, if we don't get a handle on those very things that made us so successful, we're going to become our own worst enemy. And I think we need to learn how to do this so we can talk to other intelligences and try to figure out how we can save ourselves. 
Uh, oh, okay, so then back to the boat. This summer I was lucky enough to take a week-long work course, a workshop with Bobby McFerrin and his Circle Song people. And it was truly amazing. I'm not a musician or a singer, but I went to learn how to listen. And I did learn a lot about listening, but one of the big things I learned was the, they're, they're amazing. The people are just fantastically talented and they're wonderful. And they sing as they go. I forget what's my next slide here. Oh, uh, that was us taking the boat out from Cape May. I'll give you the next one too. And that's us actually playing it to get the recording. But anyway, with Bobby McFerrin and them, I realized that what I really got to do is build some kind of boat platform vehicle. I thought of this this morning. It's going to be kind of like a zoo, but we're going to be the participant. We're going to be the ones that are being looked at and get it below the surface of the water so the whales can see it in real time and have the people sing to the whales. The boat will still be good for like getting them interested, but I think that in reality, it's going to be human voice that we're going to be able to break the language barrier, as Princess Anne said. So <clears throat> if music is the language of the gods, I'd like to see if the language of the gods goes to all God's creatures. And if so, uh, it would be nice to be able to figure out those languages. And I want to close with Julia Costacorta, who is a senior at Moravian Academy. She's on boat. And Julia Sarkozy, who just graduated in June from Arabian Academy on piano, and they will play us out.